I realized that as I, we read from uh, assignment to assignment, uh, and, and, and partly because we read in a very selective way, uh, you know, there are a lot of gaps in, the, in, the, in our readings. I, I never really have uh, tried to share with you the idea that there is a line, a narrative line, a conceptual line running through the poem. The cantos are not discrete units, poetic units, uh, without much relationship where the, the links are to be found symmetrically, maybe with cantos far apart from uh, the cantos that we, 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 we are reading. I think that there is a continuity uh, going through, uh, through many of them. And there is no doubt that, for instance, between the cantos 15, 16, and 17 of Paradise, we read last time, and cantos 17, 18, and 19, there is actually a thematic expansion of uh, some of the issues that Dante raises in uh, the heaven of Mars. Um, uh, to begin with, Canto 18, uh, Dante in Canto 18 is still in the heaven of Mars. And he meets and he lists. I know that I did not, the number is, that does not appear in your, in your syllabus, but in, you know, uh, just bear with me so that I can, I can uh, go on with these ideas. And he just lists the, the number of uh, uh, warriors, souls, who are, who are figures, heroic figures, the heroic life, uh, very much like Cachaguida himself, who appears as one of the blessed, from lines 40 and following of Canto 18. He mentions, he sees, and he mentions uh, Joshua, biblical figures, Joshua and uh, Judah Maccabeus. And then he goes on uh, mentioning medieval figures, uh, Charlemagne, because clearly he's justifying retrospectively uh, the whole issue of the Crusades to which Kachawita took part, and which can really be brought back to Charlemagne's uh, experience in France and, uh, and in Spain against the Muslims. So he mentions and lists uh, Charlemagne, and of course his paladin, the great, the so-called, the Achilles-like, invulnerable Roland, who however dies at Roncesvaux, which is uh, the site of the war between Muslims and Christians, and he dies because of the hubris that characterizes his life. Uh, the hubris of not wanting to blow uh, the bugle that would be heard by Charlemagne and Charlemagne could have come to his rescue. As I have probably said before, that became in uh, the Western imagination a most traumatic experience. A traumatic experience because it showed the, uh, that the myth of invincibility of the Christian, of Christian, of Christian Europe was simply that an illusion uh, to be turned into rubble by the invading and victorious uh, uh, Christian armies. And then he goes on mentioning the figures of the Second Crusade, uh, 1109, the Godfrey of Bouillon, uh, and uh, a figure, a Norman, who defeated actually the Muslims in Sicily, uh, the Wiscard, Robert this word, and, and brought about in the early ninth century, in the, in the late ninth century, after about 75 years, the Muslims were there, the, the, the expulsion of uh, the Muslims from, from Sicily. Uh, so we, we, a clear thematic thread between the previous cantos and this canto is the question of what is a heroic life. And the heroic life can even involve a defeat, as in the case of Roland. It implies, however, a heroic life Clearly, though there is a typology that runs from Joshua's defeat of, uh, and, and, and seizure of, the, of Jericho, you know, this is the, great, the, 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 the epic biblical story, to Whiskard, contemporary history, almost contemporary history for, for that, it implies really uh, a division. It implies a heroic life which is, this is it's, it's, it implies the, uh, the, the power to establish uh, and live for a cause, 
which is going to be, for Dante, it's a just cause, but it's a cause that brings about divisions. So it's not uh, a heroic figure, it's not necessarily a figure that would unify uh, and cut across uh, barriers and, and, and divisions, on the contrary. But Dante is indicating that, it's a that there's a possible heroic life onto uh, a, a, a giving of oneself to a cause much larger than oneself. We could just leave it that, okay? Uh, and we'll come back to this, uh, this issue in a moment. What I would stress in, 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 in a few minutes, what I would stress though about this uh, particular, um, particular scene is that Dante is really aware of divisions, aware of divisions, aware of the need even to separate uh, what is mine from what is not mine, what is ours from what is ours. So it's, it would seem, he seems to be perpetuating uh, a myth that's, uh, uh, that, or, or an idea that some might find even objectionable, that indeed the separation is dangerous and it's in itself caused by war and the cause of wars. You know, this is the, the objection to this, uh, this problem. It's not the only time that Dante is uh, establishing uh, divisions. When, when I have been talking uh, um, over the past few uh, weeks about, for instance, uh, uh, divisions and boundaries that Dante establishes, even when talking about continents. You remember that uh, in Canto VI of Paradise, uh, when there's the story of the eagle of the Roman Empire, uh, Dante goes on talking about the periphery of Europe where the Justinian and the bird of the empire had nestled, uh, the, east, the, the, the eastern part of the empire. That was the periphery of Europe. And we have been talking about the, the whole, uh, how in, in, in Canto 12 of, uh, of Paradise uh, meeting uh, Dominic, uh, uh, St. Dominic, Dante talks about the western part of Europe. He goes out of the way to mention this whole idea. So there are always divisions. There are always uh, barriers. He seems to believe that Rome and the history of Rome uh, really escapes this logic of separation. And in effect, this I know that I mentioned to you, in uh, Monarchia, the political tract he writes, he does stress the fact that Aeneas is really a Roman and not, for instance, he cannot really be thought of as a nation, which he was, nor can he be th thought of as a European. And he stresses the fact that he has a kind of some, there's a sort of uh, universalizing history in him, a universalizing impulse in the measure in which he married three women from three different continents. Creusa from Asia, Dido from Africa, and Lavinia from, uh, from Europe. So he does distinguish between a kind of sort of uh, the, a history that transcends barriers, but also an idea which is really heroic here of a, of a history that manages, what keeps barriers, that, this, that these are people who fought at the Crusades. This is uh, this, the, the, this, the, many of them, so certainly not jo Joshua and Judah Maccabeus, but uh, Charlemagne, not at the Crusades, but against the Muslim and Roland, uh, but uh, Godfrey of Bouillon and so on. And we'll see what the consequences of this may be now. Another conceptual thread, I'm, I'm really going around two or three, uh, I think I'm keeping two or three themes in my head now. Another conceptual thread between 17 uh, and, uh, and, the, and the remaining part of uh, 18, 19, and, and, uh, 18, 19, and 20, which is the heaven of Jupiter, uh, is the question of uh, a very abstract question that Dante asks. Uh, what is a place? And that was the underlying problem in, six, in 15, 16, and 17. In 15, Dante tries to determine whether his history could be reduced to the boundaries of his own native town and decides that that was no longer possible for him to conceive. Uh, the famous chronicles, he, he tries to figure out uh, uh, where exactly he can be in the history of, uh, of uh, in the midst of Florence himself, uh, it's, uh, itself and decides that he is an exile. That was the final prophecy of Cacciavida. Exile is a word that it means, it's Latin word, uh, in Italian and or in English, it comes being out of one's own soil. 
That's what the meaning is. So that in the Middle Ages, they never really thought of exile as a, just a spiritual condition. That is to say, I feel dislocated. I am, uh, my, my personal existential predicament is that of feeling that I'm out of it, that I don't belong or that kind of, that was not the conventional understanding. Dante changes this meaning of exile in making it into a, a spiritual condition. It's the condition of, it's the precondition for his writing poetry to begin with. So that poetry and exile seem to be uh, going, um, uh, going together. In 18, the real issue that he raises is what is a place? Okay, I am an exile, I do not belong anywhere. Uh, what is it? What, what, how do we understand here? And how do we understand there? Uh, what does it mean? What are these terms? What, 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 um, at any rate, so he starts and uh, he enters now into Canto with uh, the remaining part of the Canto 18. He enters into the heaven of Jupiter, a heaven of white light, which he links with geometry. You know what? Uh, geometry is uh, a science very complex science. It encompasses, what it means is the measurement of the earth. Uh, it's the whole earth that you one can measure with medieval, medieval geometry. It means it implies the presence of perspective within it, uh, with the idea that uh, geometry is what regulates uh, the idea of space and the, the uh, arrangement of space. It, uh, it implies altimetry, it implies uh, the measurement of the depth, and so on. Uh, it is, as you know, uh, traditionally linked to ethics. It has, has a, a, a profound, a intimate linkage with ethics because for the simple reason, well, uh, when Dante discusses justice, for instance, in Cantos, uh, in, in Inferno, he distinguishes between distributive justice. You remember Inferno 7, the, the goddess Fortuna who manages to distribute uh, with some idea of, Im of, of impenetrable occult equity, occult justice, the goods of the earth. You know, she's blindfolded and uh, uh, moves the wheel around so there can be some kind of uh, uniform. If you are up, you're not going to be up all the time. You may be down, etc. And if you are down, you eventually, if you are on the shifty curve of fortune, you are going to be up. It's a sort of uh, uh, arithmetical uh, notion of equity, you know, if you have, sometimes you have five, then you lose three and you get to have two, whoever has one will get two, etc. The other form of justice was also geometric justice, which Dante describes in the so-called rule of the counterpart, counterpassion, in the contrapasso in Inferno 28, when he has to establish the relationship between crime and punishment. It could not be an even one, you know, one and one. You cannot pluck someone's eye because someone has plucked your eye. That's not necessarily justice. You cannot cut someone's uh, arm off because you have uh, perpetrated that crime or kill, be killed because you just have been killed. There should be some kind of proportionality, uh, the argument. So the idea is that geometry is always part. Geometry, in fact, uh, 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 the, the is, is, uh, is, is related to ethics simply because it's uh, 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 its extension always implies a, po a point, which is the beginning of a geometric uh, uh, reflection, always implies the existence of other points. It establishes relations, therefore. That's, uh, that's the language. So uh, in this canto, Dante discusses primarily justice. Okay, what is justice? That's the idea that runs through this. The other thing that you have to be, as you read these cantos, and I hope you read them with care, um, and I will not say much about it, is that uh, uh, he deploys, Dante deploys the language of geometry. Now you know that this is a technique of this. If he were dealing with uh, arithmetic, he would do, or music, he would do that. But I just want to give you a few, a few examples uh, of, uh, of this, uh, uh, this, this issues. For instance, uh, uh, just let me open here in, uh, uh, the notion of uh, God, the geometer, for the, uh, he will go on uh, uh, talking, for instance, this is in uh, uh, Canto uh, 19, uh, uh, Canto uh, 19, um, anywhere really, line 90, 
look at this uh, uh, line. The primal will which is self good from itself, the supreme good, never was moved, whatever accord with it is in that measure just, the language of measure. No created good draws it to itself, but raying forth, ray, which in Italian is both radius, it's the ray of the sunlight, but also the radius of a circle uh, creates that good. As the stork circles, there it goes, even the, the, the various shapes, circles over the nest, uh, and then a little bit further down, wheeling it sank, then spoke, etc. Wheeling, again, a circular, uh, circular uh, motion. And, uh, and, 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 and this continues, uh, literally continues throughout. I, I want to, to find for you the image of, uh, uh, the, uh, the image of, uh, of, of, of the compass uh, that uh, I thought it was in Canto 19. I, it's not, so I, we'll, we'll get to that, we'll find it. So there are a number of these uh, uh, this, uh, uh, geometrical terms. However, the most important thing here in Canto 19 is that as soon as uh, he enters the heaven of geometry, now uh, we encounter in uh, the, I'm sorry, in Canto 18, we, we, we come across a play, a divine spectacle. It's, it's a sort of, uh, uh, the, the heavens are a sacred theater where God will go on speaking to human beings by using, to us on earth, by, uh, by using the souls of uh, the blessed. This is, uh, um, uh, this is the, the, the passage. I saw, line, Canto 18, line 17 and following, I saw in the torch of Jove, the sparkling of love that was there, trace out our speech to my eyes. And as birds, risen from a river bank, as if rejoicing together over the pasture, make of themselves now a round flock, that's a geometric image for you. Now another shape. So within the lightly, lights, holy creatures were singing as they flew and made themselves in the, figure they, in the figures they formed. Now D, now I, now L. First singing, they moved to their own notes, then becoming one of these shapes, they paused for a little and were silent. Um, within the, he the, the heaven of geometry, even the letters of the alphabet draw geometrical lines. The semicircle of D, uh, the two, uh, the perpendicular line of the L, and the perpendicular line of the I. The, the, we, are, we, are, we really discover that uh, the beauty of geometry underlies the rigor of the alphabet, uh, so to speak. But more importantly, we discover that these uh, souls that dispose themselves in letters are really uh, the w God's way of speaking to us. That the language that, Dante, that God uses is the language of human beings. We are the syllables, we are the letters disposed in order to convey this, uh, this whatever God's message may be. They showed themselves then in five times seven vowels and consonants and I noted them severely and what they seemed to me to mean. Diligite, justitium, they spell out a line taken from the book, uh, a verse from uh, the book of wisdom. Love, justice, diligite justitium, you who, just, who judge the earth. Ah, that's another reference to the actual ultimate uh, measurement of uh, geometry, the earth. I ju that's the meaning of uh, geometry, the measuring of the earth. So um, uh, geography in a certain way is part of uh, the world of geometry. Then, then Dante goes on describing a metamorphosis, how on the M of the fifth word, they kept their order so that Jupiter seemed their silver, pricked out with gold, and I saw the, the lights descend on the very summit of the M and settle their singing, I think, of the good that draws them to itself. Then, as with burning logs are struck, rise innumerable sparks from which the foolish are accustomed to make auguries, so more than a thousand lights appeared to rise again from there and to mount some, uh, some much, some little of the sun that kindled them appointed when each had settled in that place, etc. Uh, I know that some of you are working on the aesthetics of colors. I would point out this scene to you and uh, the complications of color. The white of Jupiter, the gold of the letters, 
the red of the flames. Uh, there is a kind of chromatic, uh, chromatic, a deployment of chromatic elements within this, uh, this grand spectacle. Uh, Dante is indicating as directly and indirectly the, this chromatic uh, uh, symbolism. So this is what we, uh, what, what, what w the way the heavens speak to us on earth and to the, and those who, and the rulers of the earth. Uh, and then Dante goes on in the next canto, 19, uh, wondering what is this idea of justice? What does it mean? Um, oh, he'll ask, uh, canto 19, line 28, I know well that though the divine justice is mirrored in another realm of heaven, yours apprehends it without a veil. You know with that intent and I'm prepared to listen. You know what is that doubt which is so old, a, f a fast in me. He's hungry. Dante is hungry to know what divine justice is. And uh, what we hear is uh, uh, the falcon, etc. The uh, the, the bird, uh, the eagle, goes on saying, he that turned his compass, that's God, as the geometer, an image that clearly echoes two biblical texts. One is of Job 38, a famous passage, some of you may know, Dante returns to it repeatedly, where were you when I drew the boundaries of the earth. Well, that's the geometrical, the, 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 the matrix, so to speak. Um, I, mean, I mean, with the, the of, of, uh, of uh, this um, uh, metaphor of uh, God, the geometer. And the other one is uh, in the Book of Wisdom uh, um, the, the, that goes on talking about uh, uh, I was there with him, and that was his delight when he was drawing the circle around the deep, huh? that's in the, in the book with the two, two biblical passages that insist on this, uh, both a geometric and an aesthetic, a theater, the idea that the shapes of the world are really representations of this, this perfection of uh, God's geometry. There are two metaphors that Dante goes on uh, deploying, but let's see what the substance of the argument now is. Uh, he that turned his compass, you know, we understand why he uses the word compass and the image of the compass, that's clear. Not remain in infinite excess. That's to me another geometrical language, though the two words are slightly redundant because excess means the, the, uh, the, uh, something which is measureless. Uh, uh, the, the, the language of measure, the language of uh, uh, accounting, and the language of limits is set against this idea of uh, something not, not finite, something that escapes the, the logic of geometry, okay? The logic of measurements and infinite excess. In fact, I, I, I find the phrase deliberately redundant. It's also not only infinite, but it's also an excessive idea of the infinite uh, uh, to drive, uh, drive the point home. Um, you know, a manifest could not make his power to be so impressed on the whole universe. Even the word universe is... Uh, as, a, as, as much as the poetic uh, uh, term, we speak of verse in poetry. And I wonder how many of you have ever wondered where does that word come from. It comes from geometry, because it implies a turning. You, know, you come to the end of the line and you turn, and you draw a geometrical figure, and so does the universe. It's one turning, it's the sphere. Uh, you can have hemispheres, but the two hemispheres make the universe. You know? These are all, as you see, uh, uh, I hope you enjoy them, as I enjoy them telling you about, uh, uh, about this. And in proof of this, the first proud spirit, Lucifer. Now, that's geometry of the soul. Uh, the, first, the first proud spirit who was, and as you know, Dante connects pride and geometry or perspective, as we said before. Um, the first proud spirit who was in the highest, the was highest of all creatures, fell and ripe. What a great adjective. Uh, uh, Lucifer falls and ripe because grace implies a ripeness. Ripeness. The idea that you are ripe 
when you have been touched by grace. Rightness is all one could say using another, referring to another text, not by Dante. Through, uh, through not waiting for light, that's Lucifer, from which it is plain that every lesson nature is too scant a vessel for that good which has no limit and measure. I'm, I'm not going to indicate that anymore. Itself by itself. Thus our vision, which must needs but be one of the rays of the mind of which all things are full, cannot by its nature be of such power that it should not perceive its origin to be far beyond all that appears. Therefore, and that seems to be the, um, the essence, uh, the, the brunt of the argument, the sight that is granted to your world penetrates within the eternal justice as the eye into the sea. For though from the shore it sees the bottom, in the open sea it does not. And yet the bottom is there, but the depth conceals it. Uh, the idea that uh, we can see justice only when we have a very superficial uh, and we see just as we see the, the, the bottom of the, of the sea at, at when we are near the shore. Only when we have a superficial understanding of uh, do, we, do, we, uh, do we see the bottom, otherwise we don't. Uh, God's justice is as imponderable and unfathomable as uh, the sea floor can be out, in, uh, uh, out of, uh, away from the shore. There is no light there by which comes from the clear and so on and it changes. And then Dante complicates the issue a little bit. And he really asks, where is the justice? Is justice limited to a place, to a continent, to the economy of Christian Europe? And how is it related to other places? We have a notion of what nowadays we call alterity. You must have heard that term, the other, the idea of the other. Uh, it, uh, in the Middle Ages, by the way, it was not alien to this thought of the other. Uh, I can give you a few titles of uh, um, uh, Aquinas writing a tract against the errors of the Greeks. That's, that's a sense of otherness establishing this to say differences, or Aquinas writing a summa against the Gentiles, the pagans, who usually who actually were the philosophers uh, of the time, the, the, those who do not have access or accede or want to accede to revelations. They have an idea of otherness, and the idea of anotherness is always that of acknowledging that particular difference. I do not see at this point yet any substantial deviation on the part of Dante from the myth and the examples of the heroic life. The examples of the heroic life are those who literally established boundaries, who within those boundaries managed to live according to the fullness of their virtues. That's the heroic life. And that's really the boundary that he establishes. Now, Dante asks, what is that boundary? OK, I understand that, that divine justice is impenetrable. But then he asks this extraordinary question. What is a place? What is a place? And so this was a, a man is born on the bank of the Indus, line 72. I think this is the most complex and the most ex extraordinary question in the whole of the Divine Comedy from, from the, the, the point of the awareness of, uh, let's say, alterity. No? A man is born on the bank of the Indus, Asia. And none is there to speak or read, or write of Christ. And all his desires and doings are good, so far as human reason sees, without sin in life or speech. He dies unbaptized and without faith. Where is this justice that condemns him? Where is his fault if he does not believe? And then, uh, now, who are thou that would sit upon the bench and judge a thousand miles away, more geometry here, more space, more distance, it is, comes to be not only one of depth, now one of huge distances in space, with a sight short of a span. And the span, you know, by the way, it's a, a great, you know that, it's, a, it's, it's a, a measurement, it's a geometric term too. That's the, that's the span, the distance that goes from the tip of the thumb to the tip of the little finger. 
uh, you know, this is technically Italian, spanna, and the English is span, uh, comes from it. Assuredly, for him that would reason it out with me, if the scripture were not set over you there, would be abundant room for questions. And then he goes on talking uh, as the stalks circle, and Dante is clearly circling over this, uh, himself over this, uh, these issues. And we have uh, a return to Europe. The whole of Europe now appears. The whole of uh, Cantos 100 and, uh, uh, and, and, and till the end. Let me just read this passage where um, uh, the eagle, the Roman symbol, Dante goes out of the way to say, when the shining fires of the Holy Ghost had posed still in sign that made the Roman, uh, rever Romans reverent to the world, it began again, okay, with allusion therefore to the Romans as if to, uh, as a kind of idea Rome to Dante has become an idea, an idea of universality. You know? uh, to this kingdom never ever rose who did not believe in Christ, either before or after he was nailed to the tree. But note, many cry Christ, Christ who shall be far less near to him at the judgment than, as, than such as know, not Christ uh, and such Christians, the Ethiopians, Africa is being mentioned, shall condemn when the two companies are parted. What can the Persians, Asia, once again, the three continents are going to be, so there are divisions of belief now, and these divisions of belief seem to lose all consistency because you may be a European and there is a moral alterity within Europe. It's alterity is not just a question of geographic, uh, disposition. It's not part of the economy. Someone who is a Persian is other than me. It is, but there is, in terms of the moral life, clearly there is an alterity within Europe. In fact, Dante does not, he starts with the kingdom of Prague, lines 118, Albert, uh, uh, by which the kingdom shall be made desolate, and then to France, then shall be seen the misery brought on the same, count all the countries, by the way, he seems to know the history of, on the same from the debasement of the currency by him that shall die from the charge of a boar. There shall be seen the pride that makes thirst and so maddens the Scot and the Englishman that neither can keep within his bounds. Uh, there's, a, there's a history of violence that transgresses also boundaries. All right, and that can be a violence, and I, I, will, I will give you a little story about that. It will show the wantonness and soft living of him of Spain, and of him of Bohemia, who never, uh, who never knew worth nor sought it. It will show for the cripple of Jerusalem his goodness marked with an I, while an M will mark the opposite. It will show the avarice and cowardice of him that holds the island of fire, Sicily where Archises end his long, ended his long life. And to make plain his insignificance, his record shall be in contractions and will note much in little space. A manifest to all shall be the foul deeds of his uncle and his brother, by whom a lineage so illustrious and two crowns have been dishonored. And he of Portugal and he of Norway shall be there known there. And he of Russia, Russia, meaning literally Russia, who to his own hurt has been the coin of Venice. Oh, happy Hungary, the irony is heavy, uh, if she no longer let herself be wronged. And happy Navarre, if she arm herself with the mountain that surround her. And for earnest of this, all men should know that Nicosia and Famagosta lament and complain of their own beast, which keeps its place beside the rest. So the whole of Europe, this is now the history of Europe, in a way that Dante has not, has given the history of the empire, Roman empire, but this is the history of Europe, a, a history of desolation and moral dereliction. These are the terms of, so what is here and what is there? What is, what is, what is within an economy of redemption, what is not out of the economy of, of redemption? This is exactly the question that Dante asks, and the answer is that we do not know. We do not know how this uh, salvation uh, is going to work out. No one can claim, therefore, to uh, uh, decide uh, uh, what exact moral boundaries can exist between a place and another. Um, that seems to be uh, the idea uh, that uh, he tempers, therefore, the notion, on the one hand, the idea of boundaries, and on the other hand, there is also this uh, notion that boundaries can uh, uh, are political, but they are not, nor can they be thought of as being moral 
boundary. So he distinguishes the two, the two, uh, the two issues. What, what is his answer? What is he trying to say? Before I try to tell you about this, let me tell you about a little text. It has nothing to do with the Middle Ages, but you, I'm sure you know the text. It's that little story that Herodotus, who is a great Greek historian, tells this story of uh, in, uh, uh, in the history. So really, the be before the beginning, the Greeks are getting ready to invade uh, uh, Egypt, uh, go into Egypt. And he really writes a story to warn them about what uh, uh, the dangers that m they might uh, be surprised by, uh, all the dangers wherever you go across boundaries that and violate boundaries. It's really an argument in favor of boundaries. And he tells the story of a king, the king of Egypt, uh, uh, Cauderos, I think his name is, who oh, was not a very sharp man, a very, a very bright man. Not only was not a very bright man, he also had a very beautiful wife. And he was so taken with the beauty of his wife that he wanted everybody to know about it, but he can't tell everybody. But he tells his advisor, and the advisor, who is a very prudent man, says, Sire, your majesty, I don't want to know. I believe you. Don't tell me more about this. But you've got to know. You've got to hear me. Because you know, not only you've got to hear me, I want you to see the naked beauty of my wife. It's beyond belief. And I want you to see it because human beings tend to trust their eyes more than what they hear, more than their ears. We don't really believe what we hear, that there may be, and what we see is direct, and we want to have access to it. The, the counselor very prudently says, no, sire, this is really too much trouble. I cannot disobey you, but you are forcing me to, to really insist that I, I believe you completely. You can go on telling me about her beauty. I don't want to see it. No, I'm in arranging this. Uh, and he contrives a little plot, the wife, has to go bathing some in a room next to the bedroom. Um, he, the king, leaves the door ajar, open for her to come in, the bedroom door. Um, and so while she's away, he allows the counselor to hide in the shadows of the room, the little corner. The queen comes in, undresses. The counselor sees her naked and very quickly walks out, hoping silently and hoping not to have been, been seen. The morning after, the queen, the sharp queen, calls him into her office and says, I saw you. Tell me what you were doing there. So the counselor has no, no choice but saying, Your Majesty, the king, your husband, asked me to come in. And the queen says, I imagine that that's really what happened. But uh, at this point, one of you two is one too much, too many. One of you, either you kill the king or you kill yourself. And the idea that I have been ashamed and been seen uh, naked by two men is unbearable to me. And the counselor does what I'm sure all of you would do. He became the king. Uh, very simple. Uh, and by the way, uh, Herodotus goes on even saying that you know, he lived a very undistinguished life. It was not, not a big deal. Say. But he's warning. Herodotus is really warning us to understand that there is always a limit to that we have to set up and protect between what we say me or mine, I, and what I say you. This is the language that Dante uses at the beginning of Canto 20. They say, uh, they say, I and mine when they mean we and our. You know, this is, this is the very thin line that has to be observed. Uh, uh, the king, of course, just to finish that little story, the king was, was, was a fool. He had no prudence. He had no sense of uh, the, the, the difference between the private life and the public needs. He had no idea that there are things that you keep to yourself and you don't share with others, as one can go on complicating the, the problem. But the issue is that he understood limits. You are going on into another man's country. You have to act as if uh, you don't have to go too deep into it, and you don't have to try to violate. It's uh, a country's, a woman's nakedness, meaning the, the essential, sen the private sense of, uh, of oneself. 
I do not know that Dante would really agree with uh, Herodotus in this, uh, in, this, in this cantos. But what he's been doing is literally setting up uh, a needed cultural difference. Somehow there is a, the, 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 there exist cultural differences. And at the same time allow for the, a kind of moral circulation of ideas. Let me put it in general medieval terms to tell you what, what I think he has been doing. Because the, the argument, when he makes this argument, a man is born on the river of the Hindus, he does not know anything about Christian faith and baptism, dies, why should he be condemned, etc. He has been living uh, decorously and rationally, why should he be not saved? That's the question he asks. What he's taking on there, it seems to be what we call in medieval terms a Pelagian, uh, a Pelagian stance. And you know now, you, I, ha I think I have said before, but uh, let me just repeat this. Pelagian is an adjective that comes from the name of a British monk of the roughly the time of St. Augustine, the fifth century Pelagius, who really maintained that by the exercise of, by, by through works, through good works, human beings, I would say living according to principles of nature, human beings can be saved. It would seem almost that Dante is taking that position uh, to a position, by the way, which he probably even held in the philosophical text called the banquet. That was one of, it's one of, I don't, I don't agree with that, but it's, it, there seems to be such an emphasis on the ability of human beings to live rationally that uh, the, the, uh, the demands of uh, grace and the demands of faith are uh, somewhat bracketed and, 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 and a little dim. Uh, nonetheless, I think that they are there, only that he's talking as a philosopher. And the issue is this, that Dante here is asking for a conversation between, between philosophy and theology, between reason and faith, in the sense that he really understands that philosophy without theology ends up in a sort of labyrinth of its own uh, constructions and, get, and, and, and may lose the way. And theology without philosophy may end up in mere opinion, which has no validity at all on for people who believe in uh, the power, the power of reason. Uh, now, to connect it with the previous cantos, I think that Dante has been literally extending uh, this, uh, this whole uh, uh, problem about what uh, uh, exile is. An exile which does not mean uh, the random uh, movement, uh, but always a kind of uh, uh, a sense of the prob problematical qualities of uh, uh, a place in the world and uh, uh, the relationship that we have with uh, ourselves and uh, our, own, our own ideas. I know that this was starting to get a little bit that I, uh, t has taken me away from the other cantos, but let me just uh, read 21 uh, and uh, the cantos. I just want to turn very briefly, I don't think that um, 21 and 22, uh, which are cantos where Dante meets. It's the sphere of the Saturn, which as you know is uh, the heaven of, uh, it's the heaven of contemplation. Uh, the word Saturn, the, the myth of Saturn is the myth of time uh, devouring everything that it engenders. That's what, you remember that time is the first cannibal of history, eating up what it produces. This is. Uh, you know, the minutes that I've just taken in. It's the name seems to come from the saturation, the saturation of time. And Nantes is coming to, this is the last planet, and it's also the heaven of astronomy. Uh, so he's forcing on us the idea of what contemplation is. Uh, here he finds the contemplatives, and among them there is the soul of uh, a founder by the name of Benedict, uh, the first, uh, the, the, from where the contemplative order came from. The word contemplation, uh, really implies two things, if you ask what is a contemplation? Because there's always a, a debate as to whether Dante is a mystic or he's not a mystic. I think that if there's anything that he has, it's, he's a contemplative. In the true sense of the, of, of, of the word, uh, the word contemplation translates the Greek theory, which is really the turning of the mind toward the essentials, uh, theory or contemplation. The word comes from uh, templum, contemplation, 
which is, as you know, the Latin word for, tem uh, for, ta for tempo, but also from the Latin word for tempus. They are the same words, you know, uh, tempo, the word for tempo and the word for time have the same origin. And they both come from the Greek word called temno. Uh, the Greek word is temno, which means to cut, to cut. Saturn, time, with the side cuts. The contemplatives are those who cut a space of time and privilege it, or a space in place and cut it off from the flow of history and the flow of uh, profane place and make it the, 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 the sort of ground for turning the minds to the consideration of higher things. This is uh, the point uh, that Dante is driving. He's going to discuss the degeneracy of, uh, of the order. But I want to really end with you. And uh, I, I really meant to talk about this uh, final image at the end of Canto 22, uh, where Dante now is really has reached the, uh, the periphery of the planetary system, now we will go into uh, the stars, the, 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 the heaven of the fixed stars. Okay, we have a little bit of time, so I can go slow here. Uh, lines, Canto 22, uh, lines, uh, um, uh, let's say 126. This is Beatrice speaking. Thou art so near to the final blessedness, Beatrice began, that thou must have thine eyes clear and keen. Now that's... Dante, he will, he will uh, deploy this language of visionariness. And the language of visionariness, visionariness will, will start with uh, the emphasis on uh, purifying one's, and, and, and refining one's own, uh, uh, one's own eyes and one's physical eyesight. Uh, and therefore, before you go farther into it, look down. Beatrice, it's one of the two... Uh, the, the two invitations by Beatrice now to turn back, to turn the eyes back, and we are in heaven of a contemplation, and Dante will contemplate, so to speak, the earth, not up, uh, the heavens. Turn, and therefore, uh, before you go farther into it, look down and see how much of the universe I have already put ben beneath thy feet, so that with a fullness of joy, thy heart may present itself to the triumphal host that comes rejoicing through this rounded ether. With my sight, Dante now is engaged in this retrospective glance down to the earth. I returned through every one of the seven spheres, and I saw this globe such that I smiled at earth at its paltry semblance. Uh, the perspective is that of uh, um, space. I wouldn't call it infinite space, but a vast distance of space. I don't call it infinite space because Dante's notion of the universe is not that it's infinite. Dante has the notion of the universe as uh, a bounded uh, but uh, vast uh, connect, uh, vast uh, uh, enclave. It's really like a, a book. That's the image that he uses. And that judgment which holds it for least, I approve as best. And he whose thought is on the other things may rightly be called just. I saw Latona's daughter, the moon, glowing without the shadow for which I once believed her to be rare and dense. Thy son's aspect, Hyperion, I endured there. And I saw both Maya and Ione move in the circles, I mean Mercury, near him. From thence appeared to me the tempering of Jove between his father and his son. And from thence the changes were clear to me which they make in their positions. And those seven showed me what is their magnitude, and what is their speed, and at what distance, their stations. So we have an astronomy here, the heaven of astronomy, but we have an astronomy which is indicated mythically, and not only mythically, but also through a process of filiation. It's the daughter of La Latona, the son uh, of uh, Hyperion's son. Uh, processes of filiation, it's, it's really as if the universe itself has followed the logic of generation, of production, has been uh, uh, producing and reproducing itself. And then, as he go continues, Dante goes back to looking at the earth. Uh, um, I'm sorry. And all the seven showed to me what is the magnitude and what is the speed and at what distance the stations. The little threshing floor that makes us so fierce all appeared to me from hills to river mouth. 
while I was wheeling with the eternal twins. Then, to the fair eyes, I turned my eyes again. I want to draw your attention to line 151, where Dante says, the little threshing floor that makes us so fierce all appear to me. La juola che ci fa tanto feroci. Uh, ci fa. Look at that, that line. Look at it. Uh, to me, a little hill to river mouths while I was wheeling with the eternal twins. Uh, Dante, in many ways, has uh, uh, now, that's part of his view of, uh, of, of um, uh, astronomy. He is giving his horoscope uh, indirectly here, the, this idea of uh, uh, the twins being the sign under which he was born. It doesn't really imply any astrological lapse on his part. It's now that he can be free and has de determined uh, the limitations of uh, astrological determinations. He can go on alluding to his birth sign. But I want to draw, uh, I, I just want to draw the attention to this whole point about the chi. Where Dante says the little threshing floor that makes us so fierce. Because for all its distance, Dante says, distant as it can be, can be. Um, this, for all the distance, which is implied by this, the poetic fiction, he's distant from the earth as he ever was. This pronoun, chi, us, us. The pronoun strains to have it both ways. On the one hand, Dante asserts distance, uh, the claim of a perspective of eternity on the world, and, uh, uh, but he does not, that's the other way, he does not want to, to surrender his place in time and in history. Like you, he is part of us. So at the end of all this great gyration through the universe, Dante again claims and reclaims for himself a place with us in the world of history, in the world of time. The synthesis of the two, the claim of eternity, and the sense of contingency of the self in time is the ultimate goal of the poem and the ultimate goal of uh, uh, the, the, the journey. Uh, that for Dante will be, as we shall see maybe next week, the very vision of the incarnation. The two, the idea where this uh, this to the structure, the immutable structure of history, and the process of time will, uh, will come together. Um, let me uh, stop here and see if there are, there are questions that I would, uh, about some of these issues that I raised, that I would, uh, I would welcome them, please. The passage, by the way, about, uh, maybe we should uh, even, uh, the passage where Dante talks about his own uh, horoscope was given uh, a little bit earlier, line 112 of Canto 22, uh, where Dante says, O glorious stars, O light pregnant with mighty power, from which I acknowledge all my genius, whatever it be, uh, with you was born and with you hidden, he that is the father which mortal life when I first tasted the Tuscan air, and after when grace was granted me to enter into the high wheel that bears you round, your region was assigned to me, to you my soul now sighs devoutly, that it may gain strength for the hard task that draws it to, uh, to itself. This is the, uh, uh, Dante abolishes the differences between astronomy and astrology, but from this point of view he belongs fully to his time, where there is no intrinsic, we, we, we think of them as astrologists uh, of superstition and astronomy as a science, that was not the case uh, for, for Dante. But, um, the 
Uh, another little detail, since I'm, I'm introducing the question of visionariness now in, uh, in Cantos with the contemplation, uh, let me just mention this uh, initial image to give you an idea of how Dante uh, proceeds. The initial image at Canto 21, uh, of the very beginning of Canto 21, Dante is in the sphere of Saturn where the, contempla uh, the contemplatives are, uh, and this is the ladder the ladder of ascent. Uh, but let, before we get there, uh, this is the passage. Already my eyes were fixed on the face of my lady, and with them my mind, which was withdrawn from every other thought, and she did not smile. But were I to smile, she began to me, you would become like Semele when she was turned to ashes. For my beauty, which thou hast seen, kindled more the higher we climb by the stairs of the eternal palace is so shining that if it were not tempered, thy mortal powers in it, in its blaze would be as a branch split by thunderbolt. We have risen to the seventh splendor, which beneath the breast of the burning lion raced down now mingled with its power. Set thy mind behind thine eyes and make of them mirrors to the shape which in this mirror will appear to thee. Uh, this is an extraordinary image, the image of uh, the myth of Semele, the young woman who fell in love with God. It would seem to be, uh, of course, a, 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 an extraordinary spiritual story. Ovid tells it as a very carnal story. She wants to love uh, Jupiter, and Jupiter will agree to love Semele back on one condition, that she never asks the God to show himself forth for what he is. She has to accept his the God's disguises. A variant, if you wish, of what later will appear with Apuleius, the idea of uh, Eros and Psyche. You remember the love of the, the relationship between mind and love. Uh, uh, love may, does not want to be seen for what it is and always wants simulacra and uh, deceptive uh, uh, figures to cover its essence. This is the same thing that is asking, that, that uh, Dante is recalling. And of course what happens in Ovid is that uh, Semele, in love, and because of love, love impels curiosity, uh, she asks Jupiter to show himself forth for what he is, mindless of the danger that Jupiter had predicted this would befall uh, and the danger of death that would befall her. In fact, he shows himself and she cannot bear the extraordinary beauty of the god and gets destroyed, turned into ashes. That's the myth that Dante is recalling. So that the uh, inevitable question for us is, why would Dante recall this story here at the beginning of uh, the Cantos on Contemplation? And the answer that I could give you is that uh, Dante does so because he's aware of the, the dangers of visionary claims. And this is, look, if you read the Bible, for instance, you do know that there is a tradition in the Bible among the Jews to turn their back, for instance, to even the passing of uh, what is viewed as holy, like it could be the holy ark, or they cover themselves in, uh, because of the, 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 the wisdom uh, or the tradition of not seeing, of never trying to, to, to have mixed the profane and the sacred, out of the sense of the danger that would befall the, the, uh, those who are in the space of, uh, the, of, of the profane space, or who are outside of the sanctuary. Uh, Dante is making this, or Beatrice is telling him that he has to endure the limitations of his human nature. And that his human nature, this, the trait of his mortality, uh, which is that of seeing through images and, uh, in, and, and through obliquities, cannot yet be given up. He does this as he enters the, con the heaven of the contemplatives, who they themselves were longing and desiring to see God, but accepted this longing as the sign of God's presence and gift to them. This is an extraordinary passage in terms of what Dante thinks of contemplation. 
and clearly the danger of thinking of contemplation as the condition that would allow and bring about the vision of God. Such a vision, Dante is saying, is not going to be possible while we are here on earth. So there's, this is the, the sort a number of uh, uh, ambiguities uh, about this problem. And then we could uh, also mention the uh, why Benedict? Uh, why is Benedict here the, the figure that appears in Canto 22 as the exemplar? First of all, he's the founder, as I said, of the, the, uh, of, of, uh, the life of contemplation. But a life of contemplation that appears as uh, the danger of contemplation, because Dante goes on talking about uh, the decadence of, uh, of the contemplative uh, order, which is, by the way, uh, quite true, and what that which occasioned uh, historically uh, the foundation of the mendicant orders, those Franciscans and Dominicans whom we already have encountered who want to be part of the world and, and roam around uh, in the world. But the, the, the danger of the contemplation, though, is that they can bypass and drive a wedge between the contemplative life and the active life. The ideal of Benedict has been betrayed because what he wants is an action and the life of action, the life of contemplative prayer. So that's one of the, the causes of the degeneracy that Dante pursues. And with that, we enter the world of uh, now where Dante returns. And this is what we are going to do next time to what I call basic words. Uh, somehow the whole compass of knowledge, the whole idea of uh, geography and spiritual geography, the whole idea of, how, of what triggers the writing of the poem that has been taken care of, uh, or at least uh, it Dante seems to have been facing and delivering to us his particular understanding of these problems. Now the question is, with all of this in mind, what, are the me what is the meaning of the basic words we use? And the basic words we use, and that's what we're going to talk about next time, are going to be love, hope, and, 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 and faith, what we call the three theological virtues. And they are basic words because there is no such a thing as uh, a life without trust or the difficulties of the life without trust. They can, there is not a possibility of a life without hope. And certainly that which for Dante remains the biggest mystery of all, there's never the possibility of thinking about a life or without love. It becomes a mystery because he can define the other two words. He never he escapes the responsibility of defining love. It, it, is, it is as if that were really the biggest mystery uh, throughout the Divine Comedy and in, uh, in his experience. So let me see if there are some questions now. I have thrown a lot of, uh, put a lot of chestnuts on the fire, as we say. So it's. Uh, The question is uh, that in the previous lectures I discussed, I would talk of hell as the place where the, the, uh, the smells, the concrete uh, particulars of the earth would be mentioned, it would be part of Dante's uh, warehouse of in, in uh, the representation of, of hell. Now that we're talking, we're entering the world of paradise, we've been discussing paradise, uh, Dante seems to uh, separate himself from the aesthetics, the, the sensual asp aspects of, of hell and talk more, which is still sensual though, colors, uh, light, uh, uh, colors and visionariness. Uh, right, so, uh, and then the question becomes, uh, is, does this mean that Dante is uh, clearly, clearly finding a distinction between earth and heaven, that this is really the, uh, am I rephrasing it accurately?
still very physical yes. descriptions. So what is the distinction? Yeah, well, w w you're, I, I, the, the, uh, the, the answer would be this, that in, in, uh, in paradise you do have a lot of uh, what we call earthly experiences. That's the only way he can really, he can really understand anything about, uh, about, uh, about paradise. Uh, there are dances, there are songs, you do have, there are games that they play, you do have the language of playfulness in the forms of, in the, in the form of simulations. Simulation is uh, very, it's a formal game, it's a, fo it's a reduction of the world to unseriousness, right? The game, the play, and in, 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 the, in, the, in, in the form of the degradation of the noble idea of play. Because play is, see, these things are all very ambivalent. Uh, they, they, we, are, we are dealing with the same reality, only seen from different perspectives. And I mention play because paradise is all about play. It's about playing, about uh, uh, the dance of the stars, about the spectacle, the theater, which he just, Dante has just seen a, a little uh, performance put out for him. Can you imagine the dance of the stars? They go on, it's, it's like seeing, uh, the spectacle of the of the Olympics uh, in China, you know, they, they go on with distribution of shapes and forms. That is play. Uh, it's aesthetics. So I don't. There is no difference there between uh, uh, between the two. Uh, I don't see a difference there. Of course, that has nothing to do. Whatever he's seeing in paradise has really nothing to do with the understanding of the divinity. I I'm not even. I haven't decided yet not for any reason that uh, because there may not really be time and I could I could I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be uh, I wouldn't be doing justice to the difficulty of the problem I haven't decided whether to uh, discuss the whole real you know, the cosmology of paradise of the of the of, of the universe that appears in Canto 29 of, uh, of paradise where Dante goes on talking about two universes for instance so there is the physical universe that somehow he has traversed only to understand when he goes there, there is another universe which is completely spiritual. And it's not the Platonic idea of an inverted, you know, Plato has this idea of an inverted cosmos. We are in the world which is really the projection, a projection, an unreal projection, a projection meaning, meaning a shadow of, of the real cosmos. It's not really that, they're two adjacent cosmos, both very real. And that's the, where, where, where we live and where we don't live. Beyond that, Beyond that, as a real a speck of sand, he says, as a speck of sand, you s there is a light that clearly is the light from which all, all creation uh, emanates. So God remains forever uh, a transcendent. Uh, what Dante does see at the end is his image, uh, in his own image, in the plural, our image, which m to me implies the idea that as, 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 at least Christians read the, the whole notion of Genesis is that in, uh, since we are shaped in God's image, there is our image in God, okay? There is a human component in God. So that's all he sees. He sees maybe the incarnation, but it's all of that is all wrapped in a kind of extraordinary uh, f uh, and deliberate fogginess of, uh, of representation. Um, but the, the, the paradise that he describes is not the, sensu the, the paradise of sensual delights of uh, the Quran, for instance. Uh, but there's a lot of game and play and, 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 and the stars, the amorous discourse of paradise engages and involves even the stars. They go on wooing each other. It's as if literally the whole cosmos is involved in this extraordinary dance of love that keeps it together, makes it cohere, as opposed to, say, Lucretius' idea of uh, an anarchic universe forever on the verge of, of falling apart. That, th these are the, the, the real models of, of the cosmos. You know, let's call it Lucretius and Virgil, and the way Epicurean, Epicurus and Plato. You know, this is uh, Dante and, uh, and the heavy the heavy tradition, because it's very heavy, the tradition of materialism, uh, the spiritual tradition is very small in comparison to the heaviness of, uh, of uh, uh, the physical, uh, of the, the scholars of physics who want to see the cosmos in physical terms.
But Dante opposes it, and somehow he finds a uh, kind of, that's what the universe, uh, that's what keeps the universe together, is really love. Uh, and that's what we're going to find out. That I, that I will read. The rest, I don't know. Other questions? Please. Very good. The, the question, uh, let me just record the question. Uh, the image uh, of uh, Beatrice as Semele, uh, whose smile could potentially destroy the lover, the, uh, the, the pilgrim who were to uh, look at her face. Uh, the question is, that, is that supposed to be a sort of, let's call it palinodic variant, a version of the scene of Medusa uh, in uh, Inferno 9? Uh, who threatened also, the, in that case, the pilgrim uh, with uh, petrification, with the turning into stone, the intellect would, uh, would petrify. That's really the, the allegory. Uh, and there, of course, in the canto of uh, Medusa, uh, there was also always the shield, the shield of poetry, right? The shield of Perseus. Uh, uh, and the answer is yes, ab absolutely. This is exactly what is happening. I think that this is... Uh, if you're thinking, as I think you are, of writing uh, uh, about, uh, are you thinking of writing, ab uh, no, uh, about Medusa? No. Okay. Well, but if you're thinking of ri writing a paper about Medusa, I think that you are uh, absolutely, you would, and, and the two scenes, you would be absolutely correct. The story of Medusa is, uh, but it's interesting. The story of Medusa is the story of, uh, we could view it, we viewed it, as you remember, the temptation of a looking at the past, a way of Orpheus, a turning Dante who casts himself as Orpheus, Orpheus you know who is told not to look back and yet Orpheus stands for a sort of impatience, a kind of uh, skepticism about the injunction, the fear that a Eurydice may not really be following him, he turns and loses her. Some modern mythographers even see that look. I'm, I'm thinking about a man by the name of Blanchot who says he really wanted to lose Eurydice and because he saw this way he could write poetry so that poetry can become the perpetual voice of absence, etc. Dante does not go that far, but it's clear that it's tied to a poetic experience of his own. The, the, the interesting thing about what you are saying, uh, and we could go into that maybe in, in, in conversation, uh, later, because it will take me too far, it's that this enigmatic, the, the double face of Beatrice comes to the fore here that she has, you know, uh, she was confronting the siren and threatens against the siren, and now she also appears as the, uh, the sorcery and a danger of beauty. Beauty that is that which, the, the, the language here is beauty, beauty which can which we, we hunger after, and yet it, it's that which can destroy us. And, 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 and this seems to me to be, uh, I, I put that in the, in, the, in the consciousness of the Dante's, uh, uh, the contemplatives, that Dante represents this doubleness that you long to see, and yet you may not have to, you, you, better, you are better off in not seeing. But it's true that it appears also with the ambiguity of beauty and the beauty of Beatrice, That's, that would be true. Yes? Um, so, if, so if the mirror is sort of like the intermediary, it's like the shield, like what role does um, vision and the eyes play in, 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 in mediating between what you see in the world and, and the mind that it protects? Well, Dante will, uh, is now slowly, uh, slowly preparing for this final vision, and it's going to have intermediate stages. Uh, when he will see, at the end, he will see uh, not God, he will see his own image within what the beatific vision. This is how, how far he will go. Not only that, he will go all also, there is an eclipse of the inner eye 
of memory. You know, memory is thought of as being the inner eye of the imagination. That's the, the classical de the, uh, uh, descript definition of, uh, of memory. That too will be completely eclipsed. He will forget. So that at the end of all this experience, we're ending up with uh, forgetfulness, uh, with, with a fall from that vision. I don't know that I'm answering exactly your question, but I don't know that uh, I, I haven't understood what you really want to know, uh, what you're really asking. So, um. I was just asking more about vision. Is it the regular vision? Is the, OK. The eye, the, uh, the, the, is the, what is the eye? Is the intermediary or, the, or an extension of the mind? That's really what, it, what the eye is. It's, but the vision he will have is not going to be a physical vision. It cannot be a physical vision. It has to be a spiritual vision. And so there are the limitations of the eye. See, um, that's, let me leave it at that. Let me leave it at that. Okay, thank you. See you next time.